This is also why victims can't always speak up or fight back. They freeze. It's a natural response. Their whole body is frozen. They can't do anything. They can't say anything. It's like they're just stuck. Welcome to Book Therapy. I'm your host, Kim Patton. There's no way to count how many books are floating around in this world. Some are decent, some are truly terrible, and some are great. Today, we're going to take a deep dive into one great book. Together, we will discover gems of truth and encouragement to help you face your current season of life. I'm ready. You're ready. Let's get this party started. Hello, hello. Thank you for joining me today on Book Therapy. We are exploring some social justice issues today through very, very powerful stories. But first, I would like to encourage you to hit subscribe and follow on this podcast. And if you're loving this content, please leave a review. This would help so much to spread the word about the show. Thank you for listening to and supporting the Book Therapy Podcast. Let's dive into the book. It's our first fiction book of the show, but it is based on true stories, which makes it extra powerful, but also extra haunting. And I want to begin the show with two disclaimers. First of all, uh, we are going to talk about sexual abuse and sex trafficking, and I would recommend you pop in the headphones if you are around little ears. So maybe this isn't the best episode to listen to in the car on your way to the pool. Secondly, I am not an expert when it comes to studying complicated issues such as sexual abuse and sex trafficking. I really don't know a lot about those issues specifically, and that's exactly what we're talking about today. I'm coming to this episode with an open heart and open mind. And we will just be discussing what I have learned from the first book primarily. And then I also have a second book that I'm going to be referencing. Please know that there's a lot of sensitivity around these issues. And I'm well aware of that. And I don't want to claim to be an expert. So I apologize in advance if I don't address things the way that you would have preferred. That is definitely a real possibility. And I'm just letting you know that I'm very aware of that. And I'm open to learning more about these issues and how we can help women who have suffered. The book we are talking about today is called Sold by Patricia McCormick. She is known by co-authoring I Am Malala with Malala, which was also a fantastic book. She's also written other books. Um, One of them was called Cut, and that is about a teenage girl and addresses the issue of self-harm. I did really enjoy that book. It was obviously a sensitive read, but the way she addressed a sensitive issue with a beautiful story and very powerful characters uh, was really, really good. So Patricia McCormick is quickly becoming one of my favorite authors. Soul tells the story of a 13-year-old girl named Lakshmi and her shocking journey of being sold into prostitution. Patricia McCormick uses story to tackle the big issues. The way she does this especially in Sold, is by conducting many, many interviews in the location of which this book was written. She did real research. She was a journalist. She went overseas. She talked to women who had lived this story, and she compiled it into a novel in verse, which is both beautiful and heartbreaking, and it teaches you a lot about what women suffer through and how they've overcome. The first thing that really stuck out to me was that Lakshmi didn't know what was happening to her. She thought she was going to the city to work as a maid. She definitely didn't choose this path. She didn't choose this life for herself. She didn't want it. And she fought it until she realized very quickly that she had no power. Power tends to be the thing that keeps women silent. And unfortunately, that is the prevalent issue is that the people with the power get their way. And the people without the power are forced to stay silent. Sex trafficking, sexual abuse, and other evils are often done without the consent or awareness by the victim. This seems obvious, but in our culture, it has been shown time and time again that the victim is not usually believed and in some cases is blamed for asking for it, which is awful. And that's one of the narratives that we need to reverse is that the victim is the victim. Let's leave it at that. This book showed me the innocence of a child. She was only 13 years old. In some ways, that made it more difficult to read, but it helped me see most clearly that evil is done to the innocent. In this case, as is the case with many, 
She is sold into the sex trade by her family. The deception and abuse began at home and with the familiar. Her family, not all of her family, I believe it was a stepfather who sold her into prostitution. I don't know that the mother knew at the beginning of the book. You see that she has a very close relationship with her mother. Poverty also forces people to make decisions that are unsavory, maybe because they don't see any other option. They make a decision that affects their children's life forever. The first quote I'm going to read is page 94. The main character is in her new place, her new residence, and this is what she says. I don't know why I'm in this strange house or where Auntie is. It seems as though Auntie is my new mistress. She's a strict one to be sure, but I will prove myself to her. And then my mother will have a new dress, shoes for the cold season, even a new shawl made of the finest yarn. My little brother will have fruit and curds twice a day and a jacket of yak fur. Even my stepfather can get new spectacles and a vest, I suppose. And our roof, our new tin roof, will be the shiniest one on the mountainside. This is what I'm thinking as I hear the girl lock the door behind her. Her reality is shaken immediately. She doesn't know what's going on, and it doesn't take long for some other women in the home to let her know what's really going on. Another book I'm going to reference because I read it alongside it, and I do feel like it has a lot of wisdom to bring to the same issue. It's called What is a Girl Worth by Rachel Den Hollander. The subtitle is My Story of Breaking the Silence and Exposing the Truth about Larry Nasser in USA Gymnastics. Rachel in this book also talks a lot about trusting her abuser to be doing what was medically necessary, only he wasn't. It was abuse. So in both of these situations, the main characters or the women in these books trusted someone with their future, trusted someone with their present, and that person betrayed them. Secondly, the main character in Sold Lakshmi had to go to another place mentally as she lived through this nightmarish reality. Rachel in her book talks about fight, flight, or freeze. Fight or flight mode probably sounds most familiar to you, but there's also a third reaction, and it's freeze. This is how our bodies react when something feels wrong. This is also why victims can't always speak up or fight back. They freeze, it's a natural response. Their whole body is frozen. They can't do anything. They can't say anything. It's like they're just stuck. This should help us understand what victims might be facing and why we should always fight to protect them and understand what they're going through rather than explaining things away. So in the book Sold, this is how Lakshmi deals with her situation. On page 157, she's talking about how they have a TV in the house. And this is what she says. The most important button is the red one. This one can make the TV people appear or disappear. Sometimes I pretend that what goes on at night when the customers are here is not something that is happening to me. I pretend it is a TV show that I'm watching from far, far away. I pretend I have a button I press to make everything go quiet and another one that makes me disappear. Rachel Den Hollander talks about fight, flight, or freeze this way. She's talking about reading in her journals, and this is what she says on page 115. I flip through my old entries. How do you explain to someone the confusion, sick feeling, and shame without knowing why that swirls through your mind when something is terribly wrong? How do you explain to someone who has never been that vulnerable that even though I wasn't held down, I was still trapped? And even though I wasn't physically overpowered, I was completely powerless. I can't forget any detail. Two years earlier, I had stumbled across a new special on childhood sexual assault. It put words to what I had never understood, why I hadn't been able to move or speak during the abuse. There weren't just two responses to danger, fight or flight, as everyone casually said. There were three, fight, flight, or freeze. I know what freezing and fear is now. It's when you're so confused and ashamed and horrified and scared that you just shut down because reality is incomprehensible. This is hard. This is really, really hard. Many victims suffer in silence and are left with the voices in their own head, planted by those who have not protected them, but instead harmed them. This is one of the greatest tragedies. And I don't know about you, but reading those words from Rachel just shattered my heart. I don't know how to help these women. I don't know how to prevent 
evil. I can't prevent evil. But what I can do is come alongside these women who have suffered and do my best to be a voice for them. Okay, the last thing we're going to talk about without me giving away the end of the book, um, I definitely recommend that you do read this book. It is really powerful and the ending is hopeful. But the fact is that not everyone is rescued. I wrestle with the sovereignty of God on this issue and on other social justice issues, and I'm sure that you do too. This world, just it just contains unimaginable horror and evil, and history continues to shock us. We're living in the times where the news cycle is just constantly depressing, and I know that a lot of people are feeling the weight of that right now. I do trust God, and I know that all of this evil breaks his heart. It's the church's job to stand up to social issues. We're called to love and protect and fight for truth and justice. I read in another book um, that I may talk about on this podcast. We'll see. But it was written by a woman who was heavily involved in social justice issues before she became a Christian and then as well as after. And what stuck out to me is when she realized that there were people out there who are fighting for justice and demanding that the church get involved because it's their job to fight for justice too. I feel that deeply. I feel that we do need to fight for justice and the church's job is to love above all and to stick up for those who can't stick up for themselves. One thing that Rachel wrote that really punched me in the gut was in her journals. And when she was going through the whole experience of going public with her sexual abuse and bringing Larry Nasser's life and abuse out into the public, she took a lot of heat. She took a lot of blowback. And it was hard on her. She had to talk about her sexual abuse every day for years. Something that was so private to her, she had to share in front of everybody. And that, that was really, really, really hard for her. So here's a little bit more from her journals, and this is on page 117. How could you not cry out? I didn't know. Foolish. How could you not know? Because I trusted. How could you let your guard down? How could you trust so implicitly? It's over, but it's not done. You didn't cry out. I did inside. Is that enough? I'm just going to pause here and say I'm sorry if you have suffered through abuse. I'm sorry if someone did something to you that violated your trust and or your body. I'm very sorry. I know that's not enough. But please know that my heart breaks for you and everything that you've gone through. Lakshmi and Rachel both had no voice. They were frozen in fear. They were not given a choice and adults did not protect them. The biggest thing that these books have taught me is the frailty of humans and especially children. This humbles me and terrifies me now that I'm a parent. I have to grapple with how to have hope, how to trust God, how to give him my children and say, please protect them. I know that John 16, says that he has conquered the world. I have to believe and trust that. I have to believe that in the end, justice will be served and that God will get the glory. To wrap it up, we have learned from a fictional story by Patricia McCormick, as well as an autobiographical account by Rachel Den Hollander. Both of these books address the evil that the world brings and the strength of the human spirit to fight that evil. I have to be honest and admit that I don't know what I can do to help. It all feels very overwhelming. Rachel fought for years and led the way for hundreds of women to let their voices be heard. Patricia McCormick is writing books about the tough issues of life and drawing attention to harsh realities. So what can we do? Number one, we can protect those around us. We can be aware. Number two, we can have tough conversations. We don't have to leave things in silence. We can be the one to bring it up. We can be the one to bring healing to people. We can be the one to sit with people in their suffering. Number three, we can be the light and love and the hand of justice. We can listen to survivors and stand up for children. Above all, love is powerful and we are called to do all things with great love. I pray that for you and I pray that for me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Book Therapy. The two books we reference are available on my website. This is an ad-free podcast, but if you want to support this podcast, 
I am an Amazon affiliate, and so if you click the links to the books that are listed on my website, you'll be able to purchase the books and I will get a portion of that and that'll help cover the podcast costs. Once again, thank you so much for listening. If you want to leave a review, I would love, 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 love to see that. And please like and follow and share with your friends.